Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Bob Pfeiffer, and it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Lynn Perry this morning. Uh, Dr. Perry is an associate professor in psychology at the University of Miami here. Uh, she completed her undergraduate degree in psychology at Indiana University and her PhD in developmental psychology at University of Iowa. This was followed by a postdoc in cognitive psychology at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. She came to Miami, uh, to University of Miami in 2015, and her research focuses on real-time and developmental interactions between language and cognition in typically developing children, late talkers, and children with hearing loss, and children with autism, autism spectrum disorder. And with that, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Lynn Perry. Thanks, Bob, and thanks for inviting me um, today. I'm, I'm looking uh, looking forward to talking with you more about some of my research. Let me get my screen uh, up here. Um, so today I wanna share with you um, some of my research on late talkers and their vocabulary and what that vocabulary knowledge can tell us about long-term outcomes. Um, and I wanna start with this, this book I found um, called Leo the Late Bloomer. Um, and so I, I found this on Amazon. It's, it's a, a book from 1971 um, that describes the story of Leo, who's a tiger who um, isn't yet reading, he isn't yet speaking, he isn't yet drawing is another example from the book. And his father's a little bit worried, but his mother says, I'm not worried, he'll, he'll, uh, he'll read, he'll speak, he'll write, he'll draw. When he's ready, he's a late bloomer. And in fact, the ending of the story Leo is in fact a late bloomer um, and goes on to um, acquire all those skills on his own time. Um, you know, in reflecting on the message of the story, I think you know, 50 years later, the themes about acceptance and parental support are obviously still true. These are timeless morals, but the wait and see approach to language delay uh, is not. So of course, many children who are late talkers are in fact late bloomers like Leo the, the tiger in the story and they go on to catch up um, and experience you know, typical language development after that initial delay. But there are also many children who have persisting delays and some who go on to be diagnosed with developmental language disorder uh, or DLD. And yet as a field, I think we're still missing a, a clear picture of um, who's gonna be in which group. And I think that information is really critical to targeting early interventions to those children who can most benefit from them. And so in my talk today, I'll describe some of um, uh, my recent work in which we examine children's early vocabulary structure, so the words that they know, um, to assess associations with their long-term learning outcomes. Um, oops, and I just wanted to... Um, I acknowledge my collaborators, Sarah Cocker, Jessica Horst, and Larissa Samuelson, who have collaborated with me on the, the studies that I'm gonna to share today. Um, so with respect to late talkers, there's, as I said, a lot of heterogeneity in the developmental trajectories that we see. So um, some late talkers eventually catch up to their typically developing peers. I'm gonna call these um, children late bloomers. Um, while there's others who continue to have persisting delays. So I'm gonna call these children persisting late talkers. And some of those even go on to be diagnosed with developmental language disorder and have um, persisting difficulties with language across the lifespan. Um, so to better understand that heterogeneity we see in this group's um, long-term outcomes and to support language development within this at-risk population, what I've been doing is, is looking to lessons from language development and what we know about language development in typically developing children. And I think central among those lessons is that the very process of learning words, of acquiring a vocabulary, actually can help teach a child how to learn more words in the future. So early learning has a cascading influence on later learning. And so I wanna uh, look to that lesson a little bit more to set up the studies that I'm gonna share with you today. Um, so for example, to learn a word like cup, this little girl here has to figure out that cup doesn't just refer to her favorite sippy cup that she's drinking from right here, but it refers to a whole category of things. So for example, other sorts of sippy cups or paper cups uh, or things that are made out of other sorts of 
um, materials, sorry, my animation got stuck there, um, that are different materials, different sizes, different colors, that cup refers to things that share this same approximate shape. So what children need to learn is what properties matter for category membership. And it turns out that at the same time that this little girl is learning about cups, she's also learning other words, things like ball and shoe. And it turns out that most typically developing children have vocabularies that are dominated by the names of categories organized by similarity and shape. And learning that sort of regularity that balls have the same shape and shoes have the same shape and cups have the same shape, um, teaches them to develop what's called a shape bias. So that by the time they're two years old, we can give them novel toys with made up names, like giving this child a novel art shape made of marble and tell her that it's a zup and ask her which of these other two is a zup. Um, she'll be biased to pick the one that's the same shape, even though it's a different material and a different color. And that's what we call the shape bias. Some typically developing children, however, have vocabularies that are a little bit different. What I found is that some children um, have vocabularies that are more dominated by names for categories organized by similarity material. So things like ice, it doesn't really matter what shape it is or bread, it's about the material. And what we see with those children, when we play this game with these novel toys and give them novel names, and I say, this is up, which one is yours up? those children be more likely to pick the one that's the same material. And that's what we call a material bias. So she's learned a lot about material being important in the words of her vocabulary. And then she pays attention to material as she's learning new words. Um, and those differences in children's vocabulary, it turns out they have consequences for the way that children recognize even very highly familiar objects um, and animals. So children who know more words for shape categories, and again, these are things like uh, cup and ball and shoe and spoon. Um, those children are better at recognizing familiar objects, even if we change the, the properties a little bit. So things like um, cows and pigs, um, the, the shape of them helps us recognize them, but they also sort of have prototypical colors. And so we um, messed with those colors a little bit. So making a pink cow and a Holstein pattern pig. And it turns out that those kids who are one and a half um, who know fewest shape-based nouns, so they know things instead that material matters like bread and ice, um, they have trouble with this. It seems like they're paying attention to different information as they're recognizing even familiar things that maybe they've learned something different about what cows are and what pigs are because of the fact that they learned about bread and ice instead of cup and ball. Um, they're having trouble uh, focusing on just the shape being right. Um, we also see individual differences with respect to um, atypically developing children's um, generalization and, and word learning. So there are group differences in the extent to which children show a shape bias. So um, populations that uh, especially are characterized by language delays or difficulties, so children with autism spectrum disorder, children with hearing loss, and children who are late talkers are less likely than children their same age um, who are typically developing to show that shape bias. Um, and so I want to, uh, sorry, my animation got messed up. Um, so to overview the, the studies that I'm gonna share with you today, I'm gonna present three studies that look at um, vocabulary and learning in children who are late talkers. So focusing on that last um, population first, this first study looking at how differences in the words that children know, so differences in their vocabulary, relate to their word learning biases. So whether they show a shape bias or material bias or no bias. Um, and then in the second and third study, I'm gonna look at how initial differences in children's vocabulary during the toddler years predict who will catch up several months later. Um, and then in study three, how those initial differences in toddlerhood predict um, who will go on to have long-term um, diagnosis, so, so their long-term outcomes years later. Okay, um, so the first study, uh, we have children here who are between about one and, one and a half and two and a half, um, and half of them are late talkers, and that's based on 
um, their vocabulary size on the MacArthur Bates Communicative Developmental Inventory. So we look at um, where uh, they fall in terms of their percentile uh, with respect to uh, age-based norms. And then each of those children uh, who fell into the late talker group was matched with a child in the typical talker group on their age and on their sex, because we know that those two factors influence children's um, their vocabulary and their, their word learning. So all the children um, did the novel noun generalization task where we gave them novel toys um, like these here made out of styrofoam and clay and other things like that. Um, we let them play with them. And then for these objects right here, um, this would be the exemplar. This is a styrofoam um, kind of egg shaped object. We'd say, look, this is a wug. Can you get your wug? And then she'd have this little tray where each of these other two are there and she'd have to pick, is it the thing that's the same material, the styrofoam, or is it the thing that has the same shape to see, is she biased to attend to shape? Okay, and so here's what we found. Um, just for the two groups with their averages and reporting the proportion of shape choices they made. And there's two objects, one that's the same shape, one that's the same material. So I've marked here at 50%. So that would just be at chance. And what we found is that both groups of children as a group were more likely than chance to select shape matches. But um, you can see there's a big difference here between them such that those children who are typically developing, who have vocabularies who are uh, of typical size for their age are significantly more likely to show that bias to attend to shape than their peers who are late talkers. Okay, so there's a difference in they're showing the shape bias. Okay, but to understand how children's vocabulary relates to that behavior, so their noun generalization, how they show the shape bias, what I wanted to do was create a measure of the contents of children's vocabulary that was separate from the size of their vocabulary, because we already know the children who are late talkers have smaller vocabularies than their counterparts uh, who are typical talkers by definition. So I want to uh, separate out size from what the contents are. And so to do that, we used parent report on the MacArthur Bates Communicative Developmental Inventory to calculate the number of names for categories organized by similarity and shape. And so here I'm showing um, uh, the breakdown of the words on the MacArthur Bates Communicative Developmental Inventory. So the square represents the 312 object nouns on that list. And the size of the circles here represent the number of those 312 that fall into this classification. So you can see there's a really big circle of solid objects and most of those um, are in categories organized by shape, whereas very few of them name material. Okay, so there's a, a, a set number of words on that list where we know based on expert judgments that they're um, referring to things of the same shape versus very few that are things of the same material. And so we have an expectation, if you knew all the words on this list, you'd have this number that were shape and this number of material. Um, and so we use those judgments that Samuelson and Smith uh, calculated that are demonstrated here. Okay, um, so then we take the number that each child knew, of the names for categories organized by shape, so things like cup and, and shoe and ball, um, and what we did was we um, regressed out the total number of nouns that the child knew. So we can use the residuals from that regression as our measure of how many names children know for categories organized by shape above and beyond what we'd expect for their total object noun vocabulary size. So in other words, uh, on this residual measure, if a child knew exactly what we'd expect given their vocabulary size, they'd get a zero. So that's, they know the exact number that we'd expect given the size of their vocabulary. If they have a negative number, that means they know fewer than we'd expect given the size of the vocabulary. And if they have a positive number, that means they know more um, than we'd expect given the size of their vocabulary. They have an extra shape dominated type of vocabulary. Okay, so we're going to use this number to be able to control for the size of the vocabulary while thinking about the contents. Are they more shapey? Are they less shapey? Or are they exactly what we'd expect 
given the number of shape items on this list. Okay, so I'm reporting those scores that children got on that, that residual measure here. So you can see zero, that's knowing exactly what we'd expect given the size of your vocabulary. Um, negative is knowing fewer, positive is knowing more. And again, reporting how they did on that test. Are they showing a shape bias um, above 50% here? So the blue group, those who are typically developing, most of them have scores right around zero. And the more, the higher their score is, the more likely they are to show a shape bias. There's a strong uh, association there that the more shape words in their vocabulary, the more likely they are to show a shape bias. Um, but you'll see, I think right away, that the red dots are spread out quite a bit farther. So there's several children that um, actually are, are outliers compared to the data set. And that only happens in the late talker group. Um, and so there's a lot of variability within this group um, in terms of the number of shape words that they know, controlling for the size of the vocabulary. And there's also a lot of variability in this group in terms of do they show a shape bias or not. So there are a number of children who are late talkers that are showing a shape bias, just like the typically developing group. But there's also a lot of them that are showing a material bias. Okay, so there's a, there's a lot of heterogeneity, both in their vocabulary knowledge and in their word learning bias. Okay, so they're heterogeneous in both these things. And what I wanna do next in the follow-up studies is ask, can we um, use what we've learned about that heterogeneity to predict their longitudinal outcomes? So do the children that know more shape-based words, are they um, gonna have one sort of outcome and the ones that know fewer shape-based words gonna have a different outcome? Okay, so the, the goal for these, uh, the second and the third study is to ask how differences in vocabulary structure during toddlerhood predict who will catch up versus who will have persisting delays um, or even eventual DLD diagnosis. Okay, um, and so the, the second and third studies here are gonna be um, the same group of participants, a new group of participants from study one. Um, and these are participants who, um, for whom we have a vocabulary uh, checklist, the MCDI, when they're about one and a half on average, the children are about 16 months. Um, and then again, months later, on average, it's about 10 months later. So we have some indication of um, what their vocabulary is like when they were about one and a half, and then what their vocabulary is like a number of months later. Um, so some of these come from prior lab participants in my lab at the University of Iowa, um, and a number of them come from WordBank, which is an online repository for um, MCDI data that uh, people share. And so these um, 653 come from a study by Donna Thal, um, Virginia Marchman, and Bruce Tomlin. Um, and the, the really fortunate part about that sample is that for the original study, they had followed them longitudinally up until they were seven years old and had parent um, report and then clinician confirmation of whether or not they received any uh, diagnoses. So um, they, in particular, screened for diagnoses of DLD, but also other sorts of diagnoses that might relate to language, including dyslexia, um, speech impairment, and um, learning disabilities. And so we'll be able to use that in the third study to look even further longitudinally. Okay. Um, so the question for study two is asking, um, are there differences between late talkers who are late bloomers and go on months later to catch up with their typically developing peers versus late talkers who are persisting late talkers? Okay, and so, oops, sorry. The breakdown here, um, most of the children in the sample are typical talkers. Um, so here we use the 25th percentile for age-based norms in the MCDI. Children that are above that percentile, uh, we're classifying as falling into the typical range. Um, children who were below that percentile, we're classifying in the late talker group. And you can see here, um, when we look at children's percentile at that um, follow-up visit 10 months later, um, 
88 of those 258 continued to fall below the 25th percentile, but 170 of them had uh, caught up and had vocabularies now that were larger than the 25th percentile. Um, and I'm showing here the age of all three of these groups to show that it was comparable. So it wasn't, for example, that late bloomers were just um, younger or older at time one, but rather they're pretty similar um, to those children that were showing persisting delays uh, 10 months later. Okay, um, so what I wanna show you first is we look just overall across their vocabulary, the proportion of words that fell into each of these lexical categories. Um, and what we found in comparing those three groups, the typical talkers, the late talkers who actually were late bloomers and the late talkers who were, had persisting delays, is there were differences in those two groups of late talkers at time one, so when they're 16 months, in, sorry, I don't know what's going on with my animation, um, in the number of nouns that they knew. So children who were late bloomers um, who go on to catch up to more typically sized vocabularies, back when they were 16 months, they knew a significantly higher proportion of nouns than did their counterparts who had persisting delays. So even though they have very similar sized vocabularies, more of their vocabulary here in the red group, um, fell into nouns compared to other lexical categories than did those who continued to have delays. Um, and conversely, the children who had persisting delays, if we look back at their 16 month vocabulary, they actually knew a higher proportion of words that didn't fit into any of these lexical categories that we're calling other here. Um, so these words include onomatopoeia, like the word moo. They also include routine names like peekaboo, but they're not necessarily words um, that you know, fit into these lexical categories or that are maybe as useful for figuring out syntax rules like nouns and verbs might be. Okay, so we saw differences there. When we looked um, specifically at the, the types of nouns that children knew, looking at shape-based nouns, material-based nouns, et cetera, we also found some interesting differences. So here I'm reporting the proportion of shape-based vocabulary at time one, so knowing words like um, cup and spoon and ball, again. So the more of those that you know, the higher proportion you have. Um, those children who are late bloomers, when we look at 16 months, even though their, their vocabularies are smaller than the typical talkers, they know pretty similar proportions of those shape-based words. Whereas the children that had persisting delays 10 months later at 16 months, they, they knew far fewer than the late bloomers. So these two groups, they're both late talkers. They have similar sized vocabularies, but they know different types of words within that. Um, in particular, it seems to be the shape-based nouns that these, these children know fewer of. Okay, and instead, you know, given that we know that they have similar size vocabularies, they know fewer shape-based nouns, that must mean that they know more of some other sort of noun, right? Um, so what we found is that those children with persisting delays, this group in white here, they tended to know a relatively higher proportion of words naming categories for which no one thing is critical. So it's not the shape, it's not the material, it's not the color, it's multidimensional. So these are things like uh, blanket, story, present, bathroom, pizza. So they know words that aren't um, really require them to focus their attention just on one property and ignore other stuff. Okay, so to sum up from this second study, late talkers differed in the types of words that they're learning first. Um, and those late talkers who have vocabularies that are more similar to typically developing children, so they're dominated by sh shape-based nouns, they appear to catch up to a more typical vocabulary size for their age months later. Okay, so in the third study, we wanted to explore further out to more long-term outcomes. Um, and because we had diagnosis data for a large subset of that original group from study two, um, we can ask whether differences in the toddler vocabulary related to um, DLD diagnoses later. Um, and so, uh, you know, of our study, most of the children did not go on to receive any diagnosis. 
um, and only very few got a diagnosis of uh, developmental language disorder, um, or sometimes at the time of the, um, the, the original study, it was actually called specific language impairment. Um, only 10 of that sample got that. Um, and then there's a, you know, a number of children that had other sorts of diagnoses like dyslexia or, or speech disorders. Um, but we can compare across these different groups, were there any differences at, at 16 months, okay? And so here I'm just showing um, the size of their vocabularies at 16 months. So um, the DLD group, actually, if we look back at 16 months, on average, they have slightly larger vocabularies than the other groups. They're significantly larger than those children who had other sorts of diagnoses later that were made between four and seven. Um, and kind of trending, but not significantly different than their counterparts who didn't have any diagnosis. So it's clear that vocabulary size very early in development is not a very good predictor of long-term outcomes, not a good predictor of DLD. And so instead, you can make the argument that looking at the contents of one's vocabulary is gonna be um, a better uh, predictor of long-term outcomes. Okay, um, so again, we can look at lexical categories at 16 months. Um, and here, we didn't find any differences in these groups with respect to the proportion of, of words that they knew within any of these categories. So while in the second study where we're looking just based on, um, are you a late bloomer or do you have a persisting uh, delay? There seemed to be some difference in nouns and other words, but that didn't um, connect to long-term diagnoses here. We see um, variability in the DLD group in particular in terms of what lexical categories, their vocabularies um, were composed of early on. However, when we look within the, the nouns that they knew, we found um, that the, there were group differences here. So particularly with respect to the shape-based nouns that children knew, um, the children who uh, had developmental language disorder diagnoses later, knew significantly fewer than their counterparts who did not receive a diagnosis or who received some sort of other diagnosis, but not um, DLD. Um, and these two groups, um, there was a, a marginal difference actually between them, but not significant. Um, so DLD seems to have a, a kind of stronger association with the shape-based vocabulary than other sorts of diagnoses related to other aspects of language or, or reading might. Okay, um, so although toddler vocabulary size wasn't reliably associated with later DOD diagnosis, um, vocabulary structure or the contents of vocabulary, especially with respect to shape-based nouns, it is. Okay, um, so to think about why shape words might matter so much, I wanna go back to the behavioral phenomenon of the shape bias that I started with in study one. Um, so I'm showing this, this is a figure from uh, Linda Smith and colleagues, um, 2002 paper um, on uh, the shape bias, um, where they argued that the shape bias is a developmental product of previous instances of learning specific words. So, you know, learning that this specific object is a ball and this specific object is a cup and this specific object is a cup and this specific object is a ball. Learning specific words and learning categories where shape matters. So children start out just mapping individual words to individual objects. Then they start to figure out the category organization um, corresponding to those words. So cups are cup-shaped and balls are round. Um, and if they're learning lots of specific categories like this where the shape really matters, um, then they start to learn that shape just matters for other categories that they haven't even encountered yet. So that's this higher order generalization that kids figure out that you know, balls are round, cups are cup-shaped, blanks are blank-shaped. That helps them um, learn the, the shape bias that they can extend to novel things that they're encountering. Um, and then once they can do that, they can learn new words at a, at a quicker rate because they're selectively attending to their shape. 
Um, so what Smith and her colleagues argue is that the act of learning words actually serves as training for the child's attention to help them selectively focus on previously relevant properties. So if like in the context of um, typical development, a child has previously learned a number of categories where shape is important, they're going to start to selectively focus on um, shape and that's going to be helpful for learning all those other words that are out there um, where the shape also matters. But if, like we see in the context of persisting late talkers or those who go on to receive a, a DLD diagnosis, a child isn't learning those words and instead is learning other sorts of words instead that might be more multidimensional or names of routines or onomatopoeia that aren't teaching them those sorts of regularities. And then what that means is that their vocabularies aren't maybe helping them learn how to learn words um, and maybe even potentially slowing subsequent vocabulary growth compared to um, these highly relevant words that are teaching them something useful for all the to be encountered words. Okay, um, so you know, in conclusion, I think from the, the three studies that I shared with you today, that we can see that toddlers who know a smaller proportion of shape-based nouns um, are less likely to show a shape bias. And they're also more likely to continue to show language delays months and even years later. And um, although the analysis of DOD that I have here is preliminary because there's such a small sample, again, it's only 10 children, I think this finding points to vocabulary structure being one potentially useful um, early indicator of risk. And I think the early part is particularly important to know, um, you know, as young as 16, uh, 18 months um, who might uh, need extra supports and what sorts of extra supports they might need to um, help them with language. Um, so I want to thank all the participants, and their parents and, and Bruce and Donna for sharing their diagnosis data from their data set and of course um, collaborators and funders. Um, and thank you for your attention. Oops. Um, so I'll stop sharing and open it up um, for questions. And you can either put it in the chat uh, or raise your hand if you want to ask a question. Are there any questions at all? Thank you, Christina and Christina. Um, Valerie, I can't tell if you have a, uh, a question. Maybe you're still typing it out. So uh, Valerie asked my, uh, okay, I'll wait. Um, so Valerie asks, um, how would you categorize a child who reads but doesn't verbally request his need. So um, I guess in the scenario, maybe uh, the child is having some difficulty or delay in their expressive language, but they seem to have um, good comprehension and, and the ability to read. Um, is that this? Uh, oh, so um, yeah, I, so I don't know, it might be you know, slightly beyond the scope of, of the, the work that I presented today. It sounds like from that description that they might have an expressive language delay, you know, which is related to the group of late talkers. If they're already reading, I'm guessing they're a little bit older. Um, so it's possible that they could have um, developmental language disorder, although that also is often associated with, with difficulties reading. But, um, you know, I think in general, the lessons from, you know, what I'm learning in my research suggest that taking a deep look at vocabulary can be important for understanding um, you know, children's different strengths uh, and, and difficulties. And so that could be relevant in that situation too. Um, okay, uh, Anai asks, is, is that the same 
phenomenon for bilingual and multilingual children? I think that's a great question and one that I'm starting to look at here in Miami. So looking at the extent to which um, the types of words children know when one language is similar in another language and if you know, the two languages together are helping uh, direct them of what to pay attention to and learn new words in either language or if it's kind of constrained within one. Um, and I think that could be, you know, useful for understanding language delay in the context of bilingualism and, and giving supports either in both languages um, or maybe in, in one uh, more targeted, but that's, a, that's definitely an open question. It's very interesting. Um, yeah, and so the, uh, Jasmine asked, is there a list of early shape-based nouns? Um, so my colleagues and I are in the middle of, of making a paper that has kind of usable tools like this for um, clinicians, SLPs, for other researchers um, to just be able to access that um, more publicly available than we have it right now. Um, I'm happy to share the list with anybody um, that wants to send me an email. Um, I can I can share that now, but we're working to make that more publicly available with the thought that then um, researchers or, or clinicians might want to um, take the words that the parent reports on the MCDI and then compare it to the classifications we have to get a sense of is that child um, kind of similar to their peers of the same age in terms of how many shape based nouns they know, or uh, maybe they know fewer. Um, Raquel asked, did the uh, other diagnosis category include autism? So no, it didn't. So in that group, the, um, none of the participants had a diagnosis of autism. The other included diagnoses of dyslexia, speech impairment, and learning disability. Um, that's a great question. Yeah, and we have seen that, that kids with autism are less likely in the preschool years compared to typically developing children to show a shape bias, but it's sort of a new area of investigation to know, is that a delay or maybe they're paying attention to something else, um, what's going on there more long-term. Um, so that's another direction I'm interested in going. Um, oh, and Millie asked the same question about the list. Um, yeah, so I, I can make my email available in the chat um, and people can follow up. Um, and I can share the, the list that I have and communicate about how to use that. It's right there. Hi, Lynn, this is Christina Pujol. Hi. Um, I'm a speech language pathologist and this information is very helpful. And I'm wondering how other SLPs can use this information to help guide parents in like teaching their children new words as they're in that critical age of <laughs> language development. Right. Um, so if I think there's a, a particular concern about the child not, you know, picking up on, on object noun categories or not picking up on the shape ones, then those could be targets. Um, and one thing that we've done in the lab and in intervention or training type studies is um, made sure to have kind of varied examples of a category. So in teaching the word bucket, for example, having ones that are different colors and different textures to really highlight that you can ignore all that stuff. It's something about this shape. Um, and so making sure um, the examples used, it's not just one example, because that makes it hard to know exactly what it is, especially if a child's already having some difficulty paying attention to shape, but having examples that really contrast on all the irrelevant information can be really helpful. Thank you. That was, that was very helpful. Yeah. Yeah, and so Valerie asked, would you suggest teaching kids words and categories? Um, yeah, so I mean, I think we can think about teaching words and categories at multiple levels. So the one I just described about, you know, buckets that vary and, and going through that as you play so that you can kind of con contrast, like these are all the same shape, but they're different colors or textures. That's one important way, I think, to teach categories. The other sort of way, which I think often it does happen um, in the intervention practice is um, kind of semantically related categories. Um, so I don't know, tools versus foods and those sorts of things. And I haven't really um, connected that sort of category yet to my work here. Um, I think it is helpful to notice kind of regularities within a category and across. And so I think um, that's another thing to continue doing. Um, I don't know exactly how that you know fits in with the, the late talker piece, but I think that is an important part of intervention. 
Um, any thoughts of how you can use these inform this information when also targeting children who use AAC devices? Um, yeah, so uh, I guess it depends on the flexibility of how the, the device is already programmed and what words are available. But if, um, if there's a way to, to work through um, like uh, object noun labels and, and maybe relate those to different examples in the real world, world that could be a good place to practice. Um, I know some of those devices start on um, like kind of more abstract words like prepositions and things like that. But you know, from a lot of the research that I've done, um, it suggests that starting with concrete nouns is a really important foundation to then help children be able to pick up on verbs. And once you get verbs, then you can combine things together. And so starting with the nouns, if that's where there's some difficulty, might be a useful way in. Um, and so I don't know too much about the extent to which that's feasible with all devices, but it could be maybe done in conjunction with the device. Any other questions? All right, while well, there is a moment of silence, let me remind you all that uh, there is a survey that needs to be filled out. And that survey is very important, especially if you are requesting continuing education hours. And even more important, if you are if you are requesting ASHA continuing education hours. And so, be sure to, to complete the survey uh, about today's Brain Rounds presentation. And um, the the link to it is just appearing now in the in the chat. So, those of you who have closed the chat can open it up and see the link to access the surveys. Lynn, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. I really appreciate it. And thanks for all the great questions. These are you know, great things to think about in my, my future research. Okay, thanks everybody. And feel free to, to email me if you wanna follow up other questions or to talk a little bit more about the, the shape-based words. All right, if there are no more questions, you all have a very good day and a good weekend and be safe.